joining us here at the Potter's House International Ministries. Here at TPHIM, we proudly proclaim that Jesus is Lord, love abounds, and everyone is an evangelist. We want you to know that there are four ways that you can continue to be a blessing to the kingdom. You can give first through text giving at 904-601-1695. Just text the word give and follow the prompt. The second way is online giving at tbhim.org or through the Ministry One Church app. Also, you can mail in your gifts to the Potter's House International Ministries at 5119 Normandy Boulevard, Jacksonville, Florida, 32205. We thank you for your giving. We appreciate all that you do to help us to continue to be a blessing to our community. Friday afternoon, and Jesus is dead. His brutalized body hanging without life on a cross dropped into a hole in the dirt. His executioners had dug the holes, prepared the place, and done their job with ruthless efficiency. This wasn't how it was supposed to be. The hope of mankind overcome by powers of hell, by the shadow of a grave. We once knew what it was like to rule and reign on the earth. We were made to live in the light, in relationship, in purpose. We were made for more than what we've come to accept as normal. Ever since the garden, Satan and his kingdom have been tightening their grip. Darkness has ruled evil, chaos, suffering, hopelessness. We've been enslaved and crippled by the holes the enemy has been digging for us too. Instead of killing the Messiah, the cross became a catalyst for salvation. The hole that was dug to hold an instrument of shame and death was instead filled with an instrument to bring healing and new life. That's the way God is. Nothing is impossible with Him. He's always restoring, always renewing, always able to take what was meant for evil and turn it for good, to take our graves and turn them into gardens. Why? because he never gave up on his plan. He has never given up on us. He knows what we don't, that you can't have resurrection life without death, Jesus. He died so we can have lives of purpose and power over the grave. He is not dead, he is alive. And because he lives, we can live again. Fall 
lover, let this cup pass from me But if I must go through this catastrophe Let it be, they need hope and I hate sin I don't mind being murdered if it rescues them But how could they forget how I lived? Did they forget what I did? How I fed them and healed their kids? Through faith in the disciples, I told them to eat Asked them to stay awake, but they fast asleep for money Even Judas turned his back on me He betrayed me with a kiss, how can this be? Soldiers came, locked me up and threw me in court
Can somebody give us some glory in this place tonight? Are you thankful for the sacrifice? Are you thankful for the sacrifice that was made? Are you thankful for the sacrifice that was made? On this Good Friday that we celebrate the sacrifice, the ultimate death, the death of all deaths that gave us life. Are you happy? Can you celebrate the sacrifice tonight? If you can, do you mind standing on your feet and giving God some glory? Can somebody shout to the Lord in his place? For our King now lives. Though we celebrate his death, our King now lives. He is the King of glory. And we shout, Hosanna unto our God. Hallelujah. Let's start worship here at the Potter's house. Let's go. Hallelujah. Yeah. Come on, put those hands together. Hallelujah. Come on, give us some glory. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Let's go. Come on, clap those hands with us. Yeah. Here we go, right here. Come on, somebody say the angels say. The angels come out at the thought of you. Yeah. The darkness gives way to the light for you. The price that you pay is a slide. Brand Come new. on, say Hosanna. Hosanna forever. We worship. Yeah, say Hosanna forever. Let's do that again. We worship. Come on, say the angels. Say. The angels come down at the thought of you. The darkness gives way to the light for you. Come on, say. The price that you pay is a slide. Brand new. Yeah. Hosanna forever. We worship. Hosanna. Hosanna Let's take it out. We for your patience. For your patience and kindness and favor and mercy and honor and glory. Because God, he's worthy. You are worthy. We can't live without you. We can't breathe without you. We, we can't sing without you. Hosanna. Come on, somebody declare it and say. No man out in this world but you. We give you glory, no God. No one can compare to the things you do. Hey. Father, 
the crowd pressed in to see a man condemned to die on Calvary. He was bleeding from a beating, and there were stripes upon his back, and he wore a crown of thorns upon his head. As he bore with every step the torn of those who cried out for his death. Down the sea, Dolorosa called the way of suffering. Like a lamb came the Messiah Christ, the King. But he chose to walk that road out of his love for you, for me. In Jerusalem, los lados le abrían paso a Jesús. Mas la gente se acercaba para ver a qué llevaba que.
So you came and changed my life So you cleaned me up inside You thought I was to die for You thought I You thought I was to die This is right. Come on, let's praise him like we know he's real. He did it so you could be free. So you could be whole. So you can tell everyone that you know. You thought I was worth saving. Come on. So you came. You came. You thought I was worth Come on, give me the word. You picked me up the inside And you thought I was to die for So you sacrificed so you sacrificed your life So I could be free So I could be whole So I could tell everyone I know Hallelujah, say hallelujah Come on, hallelujah seated this is a powerful night it is an important and strategic night 
it's an important and strategic time in the history especially of the United States of America things seem to be slipping out of our hands out of our control people are seemingly resisting the things of God and have chosen the ways of man we're in an hour now where these types of services are necessary the reminder of what Christ did is necessary a celebration of what Christ came to do is necessary a hunger for the things of God is necessary a thirst for righteousness is necessary religion is over sitting down and waiting on somebody to entertain you or waiting on something to happen the hour is now is where the Lord is seeking true worshipers those who will worship him in spirit and in truth those who brought something with them those who come into the house of the God ready to impart and ready to celebrate and ready to encourage somebody else help somebody else bless somebody else so many people have pulled out paper and pencil over the years and have filled their notebooks but have nothing in their hearts but this is an hour now where God wants to to move on the inside he wants to transform us on the inside he wants to give us what we need on the inside but you won't get it unless you hunger blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled come on there needs to be a hunger in the house of God there needs to be a thirst in the house of God no 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 you just can't sit there like a gator by the lake no 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 you just can't act like this thing is about you no 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 no, this is not the movie theater. No, this is not a theater production. No, this is not some dramatic play. No, this is the real thing. This is life. This is what God is all about. It's his people coming together, cooperating to give his name, praise, and glory. His preachers standing up and preaching the unadulterated gospel, representing him properly from the word of God so that we're strong and we're able to resist the devil and the devil will flee from us. So everybody, why you got a chance? If you're able to stand if you're going to walk out of here tonight if you're going to walk out of here under your own power i don't know why you would not give god some praise and put those hands together and open up your mouth and leap like a hind like you got hind feet like a deer panted for the water your soul ought to pant after him if you're at home if you're there in your own house you ought to bless the lord if you got to run through your living room run through your kitchen and through your den and run out even in this chilly night on the back porch and tell the lord thank you let your neighbors know for the lord you live and the lord you time let your neighbors know that for me and my house we gonna serve the Lord let your neighbors know they're next door to somebody who's connected to God that they'll be blessed in your overflow that your overflow is gonna go from your house to the next house to the next house to the next house you've been strategically placed in your community to bring the glorious light of the gospel the power of God into your community oh let all the world see that the people of God are alive and well well, we ain't scared uh, we ain't backing down uh, it's a fight uh, but we've already won the fight it's a fight uh, but we already have the victory it's a fight uh, but we're already overcome by faith in Jesus Christ we are that army we are that last day we are that last day army we are that shoulder to shoulder Zephaniah army we are that shoulder to shoulder Zephaniah army of the last days together we can do this together we can make it so I just want to thank God for you those that are watching at home share this those in here share it with somebody and let somebody know it's good Friday where else can people be what else can people be doing tonight more important than recognizing and remembering that Friday night a passion week God bless you. Be seated if you can. A shout out to Bishop Derek Calhoun for his message this past Wednesday. I am so grateful to God for those types of preachers. I told him he's anointed to do what he does. And I'm grateful to God to have him in my life. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to read two verses. Verse 3 and verse 4. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 and verse 4 for 
Boy, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Uh, the verse that leap, leapt out at me and leaps out at me is verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to to the scriptures tonight from the topic Jesus came to die Jesus came to die this is one of those messages and go with me now uh, it's a message like the Christmas message remember and the Easter message it's a message where the story does not change so the Easter message is going to be the same year in and year out. The Christmas message is going to be the same year in and year out. When we speak of Easter, we talk about the resurrection. And the resurrection is the same story. He rose. When we speak of Christmas, we speak of him coming, the incarnation. Christ came, born in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothing. The story does not change. It's like our ancestral tales that we share with generations or those things that are common to our family that we want our next generation to never forget. We tell them how we got to where we are. Here's what went on. Here's what happened to your grandfather, your great grandfather. This is what happened back in the day. So those stories are repetitious and they don't change because they're factual it's just the way it happened and when it gets to friday night of the passion week and jesus dying on the cross we don't have to add to or take away from the details of that friday of passion week we should know it people always say like they know the back of their hand but honestly i have no idea what the back of my hand looks like but we ought to know it like we know ourselves, our tendencies, our proclivities. We ought to know it like we know our children if we raise them properly. Especially nowadays. Because of this message and the events that are wrapped into this message are right now under serious attack, particularly in this nation. Uh, the gospel is under attack. The preaching of the cross is much foolishness to those who are perishing. And they're trying to make the rest of the world believe that we have believed some fairy tale or some fable that cannot be true. That a man dying on a cross 2,000 plus years ago is what it takes for mankind to have a right relationship with a spiritual being, supreme being called God, who in the end is going to come back and going to judge the world and receive his own. For so many people, that's nothing more than fiction and a fairy tale. So we have to, as believers, know in whom we believe. And we have to have the facts so that we are ready to give an answer to every man. For it is the reason of the hope that lies within us with meekness and fear. So what we believe about Christ and the gospel message is now being treated with much disdain by the new establishment or this new order that seems to be ruling in the land. And this is a philosophy. I'm not talking about people. I ain't mad at a human being. We have one adversary, the devil, and he's the father of lies. He's the father of deceit and deception. He manifests himself as an angel of light. If any man is being used to deceive anybody, he is being used by the deceiver himself. And one thing we need to learn about the devil, when we stand up for what's right, he will slander us because he is a slanderer. He is the accuser of the brethren. So many people can't move forward in the things of God because of the things that the devil knows you did in your past. And even though you pleaded the blood of Jesus and have repented of them and have been washed once and for all, sins cast into the sea of forgiveness as far as the east is from the west as he separated you from your sins. And yet so many believers allow the enemy to go into the sea and pull up stuff out of their past and dangle it before them as skeletons in the closet. But can I tell 
tell you that if they're skeletons, that means it's dead. There's no flesh on it. There's no substance to it. It's nothing more than dry bones. We have now legislated perversion and religious intolerance in the name of inclusion and equality. Be not deceived, my friends. There are people who are pushing for what appears to be the right thing. Equality amongst the races, equality amongst the gender, equality here and equality there in the workplace and politics, every kind of way. And equality. But we cannot have equality uh, for, and, and it get lost in inclusion to where now we have no morals and we have no values and we have nothing to measure equality by. A lot of stuff that is being deemed civil and civil rights are not civil rights, they're individual rights from special interest groups. So that's not my message. I wanna get back to the Good Friday message, even though it all ties together, probably the closest that we've ever come to seeing with our own eyes, this horrific event of that Friday night that we call Good Friday, was brought to us, and many of you saw it, by Mel Gibson. Uh, Mel Gibson brought it on the big screen. The movie was called The Passion of Christ. Do you know that to this day, I cannot watch that movie by myself? Do you know that I went up in my theater room one night and it was about one o'clock in the morning and I thought I had the DVD and I, the 4K, I thought I would throw it in so I could get the clear depiction of what happened. Man, I put that DVD in and in about 25 minutes, I was back downstairs eating some milk and cookies and ready to go to bed. It's, it was just that, that chilling to me, the movie. I had... Uh, <laughs> My people that I know say, man, I can't take my eyes off this. People all over the nation were glued to their screens in, in their homes and even, of course, in the big screens in the theater. But the most interesting part about these audiences that were glued to the screen around the world, especially in America, is that not one word of English was spoken in the whole movie. People didn't get up, some folk weren't like me, I was too scared, but some people didn't get up, didn't move, and there was not one word of English spoken in the movie. It was the seventh highest rated or grossing movie of all time, made over 600, 700 million dollars, and the entire movie was in Aramaic. Aramaic. Aramaic was the actual language that Jesus spoke in his day. It was subtitled in English, of course, in America and in all the other languages around the world. There are only a couple of countries in the world today that even speak Aramaic any longer. And it's a part of uh, the country of Syria. They speak Aramaic and there are few spots around the world. And so everybody had to have subtitles. Everybody had to read what was going on on the screen. The entire movie actually was only covering the last 12 hours of the life of Jesus while he was here on earth. His true passion, his true raison d'etre, his reason for being here. It started, we know, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Many people uh, think that he began to bleed on the cross, but no, he began to bleed in the garden. The Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane is called the press, the place of the press, the oil press. It's a place where they would take the olives and they would crush the olive in order to get what was in the olive out of the olive. In order to get the oil, you got to crush the olive. And so many people want the anointing, they just don't want to get crushed. <laughs> but if you have an anointing abiding in you, in order for that anointing to flow, there has to be some pressure or something that comes to squeeze that anointing out of you. Physicians have confirmed that the kind of pressure that Jesus was under can cause actual literal blood vessels to burst and to appear like sweats that is drops of blood that sweat appears to be drops of blood because literally it is it's a medical condition called hematidrosis hematidrosis is a condition in which capillary blood vessels that feed the sweat glands rupture causing them to exude blood occurring under conditions of extreme physical or emotional stress 
hematidrosis. It happens when there's a high degree of psychological, emotional, and mental stress on an individual. I heard somebody say, man, I was in so much trouble, man, I was sweating bullets. And in essence, that's what they're trying to say. Sweat so heavy, sweat like blood, to where out of your actual sweat glands, these vessels burst, these, they rupture because of the pressure and psychological strain. Is there anybody here over this past year that have felt like, my God, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, that have said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. If it be possible, let this thing hurry up and get over. Has there anybody here said during this past year, God, I don't think I can take it anymore. God, I can't handle this any longer. God, I got to get out of here. I got to get up from here. God, please step in and do something. And I've told you from day one the whole while, God says, I have been waiting on you if you just come to me if you just return to me if you keep your mind stayed on me I'll give you perfect peace and bring your blood pressure down I'll give you perfect peace and remove that stress and anxiety that's causing you to sweat bullets so the movie culminated with the brutal depiction of the death of the, on the cross the death of Jesus Christ it was so grueling as I was studying this and preparing for this. It was so grueling that there was a woman, you might remember this, in Wichita, Kansas, that died of a heart attack in the theater while she witnessed the torturous death of Jesus on that cross. She screamed and died. She couldn't take it. Her heart gave out when she saw what Jesus went through. This is the focus of the message tonight. This is why we're here tonight around most of the world, at least in our time zone, preachers will be focusing on the passion, on the death of Jesus, the very reasons for Jesus coming into the earth realm. The Bible is clear as to the reason that Jesus came to earth. You ever think about this verse, 1 John 3, 8, it says this, for this purpose was the son of God manifest or shown that he might destroy the works of the devil this is exactly why jesus came to destroy the works of the devil and we know where he did that the bible says on the cross of calvary he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly triumphing over them nailing our sins to the cross y'all not helping me not holding anything against us any longer because of his blood we've been set free so the passion again is defined as Jesus suffering and his death by something called crucifixion. Remember the story does not change. He didn't die some other way. There was nothing else Jesus did to set us free but die. And crucifixion has built into it a, a word that we often use excruciating, excruciating. Crucifixion is an extreme method of torture, of punishment that is not necessarily even synonymous with death because you could be crucified and not die. You could be tortured. You could be uh, in excruciating pain for an extended period of time at the hands of man. Death is normally the result, but we have some cases in history where some people have lived and lived for days and months after. So what makes dying such a gruesome death on that Friday a good Friday? I talked to a pastor today from up in the great north, and it was a lot more chilly than it is here. And he was saying, why oh, is this a good Friday when Jesus died on that night? He's a pastor. And I was like, okay. It's like John said. It's only good when you realize that his dying is what God intended to destroy the works of the devil. And I say it again, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Ladies and gentlemen, women and children, boys and girls, Jesus came to die. God chose death to defeat death. Oh, come on. Death was the last enemy of man. And God came and died on a cross. The Son of God, God the Son, 
and we're free. So when we rehearse those 12 hours, whether it be on the big screen or right now publicly preaching and on these platforms that we have and the social media platforms and television and whatever, it makes those of the Orthodox Jewish persuasion cringe a little bit because we need to understand um, our Jewish brothers. When you read the text and if you watch the movie, it appears, it literally depicts that it was the Jews that were the murderers of Jesus. That it was them. It was Pilate them. It was the Jews that said, away with Jesus and give us Barabbas. At least when you look at the text and you see it, it appears that the Jews are responsible for his death. So the movie itself was protested and, 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 and it was called anti-Semitic. And, and, and there were certain Orthodox Jewish sects that would be outside picketing, showing that this is uh, something that is accusatory and, and it makes them look bad. It showed Jews in a bad light. And, and, and it looks like when their Messiah came, they killed him. Now, now, if you read the text, and one of the texts used is that the Bible said Jesus came into his own and his own received him not. That light came into the world and the world and the Jewish world preferred darkness to light. That they rejected him as the promised Messiah. So the text reveals that Jesus, though, don't want us to be mad at any person. That's why I keep telling y'all, I ain't mad at any man. People are frail. People are human. People live in a fallen state. People can't help themselves. There's none that do good. No, not one. There's nobody that seeks after God. All we as sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own own way we have uh this this sin nature in us that keeps us from doing that which is right so jesus didn't want anybody to feel responsible for his death and 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 they did realize that and here's what we need to realize that it was all the plan of the father right the text reveals that he himself didn't want them to feel responsible but that it was all the plan of the father let me show it to you remember joseph who is a type of christ a type of deliverer when his brothers were fearful for doing to him what they did remember his brothers that sold him into slavery and his brothers had forgotten him and all this kind of stuff and lied to his father gave him a, a, a robe that was dipped in animal blood and said joseph was dead and then <laughs> they found out he wasn't and in Genesis 45, 7, here's the encounter. He says to his brothers once they see him, God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all Egypt. You missed it. He, they, they were going, like, oh God, what is Joseph going to do to us? We're responsible. We said, him, his Joseph said, no, 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 no. You were just a part of the plan. It was God's plan to send me here. Remember the verse in, in Genesis 15, 20? He says, by the way, what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. He didn't turn it around. He used you. And some of y'all that have been in bad relationships, you need to let them folk go and just say, God used you. If I never had connected with you, I wouldn't be as in love with God as I am right now. Had I never not spent that one night with you, I would not be as close to God as I am right now. Had I ever not been divorced from you, I would not be as close to God as I am right now. Had you never lied on me and betrayed me and stole my money and acted the fool and tried to slander my name and tear me down, I wouldn't be as close to God as I am right now. Had you never not lied on me, I wouldn't be a praiser of God like I am right now. Had you never not done and everything that people have done to you, what the enemy meant for evil, look at you. God meant it for good. You had to go through that. You had to endure that. You had to do it. Jesus had to die. He said, nobody took my life watch this he makes it clear that no one man not one even nationality could take his life john 10 17 therefore my father loves me because i laid down my life that i might take it again no one takes it from me 
but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Glory to God. Jesus said, did nobody take my life. Y'all don't take responsibility for this. It's in the plan of God. This is not a plan gone bad. This was a plan that was in the mind of God from the beginning. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus said, y'all didn't do this to me. I came to do the will of my father. Hebrew 10, 5 through 7. This is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the scriptures. The blood of bulls and goats and turtle doves and messing up your car to come to worship today is no longer necessary for Christ shed his blood once for all the perfect lamb of God John said behold the lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world Jesus died in your place once for all he didn't want burnt offerings or these type of other offerings for sin any longer I wish I had somebody in here so now when you come to the house of God you don't have to bring a bull or a goat or a turtle dove you can bring the sacrifice of praise with the fruit of your lips all you got to do is come in and open your mouth all you got to do is be the redeemed of the Lord and let the redeemed of the Lord say so all you got to do is lift up holy hands uh, in the sanctuary those of you who come by night in the house of the Lord all you got to do is make a joyful noise unto the Lord why because Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left the crimson stain but he washed him white as snow that's what can wash away your sin the blood of Jesus and because your sins have been washed away you don't rejoice that demons are even subject unto you but you rejoice that your names have been written in the book of life rejoice in the Lord always Paul said again I say rejoice how can you rejoice Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain but he washed them white as snow uh, and that ought to be a reason for somebody to get happy that ought to be a reason for somebody to stand on your toes and, and twist around and he was sent in a body as an offering for sin it's an offering for sin John 2 verse 19 Jesus answered and said to them destroy this temple and in three days who will I will raise it up who will I will raise it up. Then the Jews, the other ones who feel in some kind of way, said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Good God Almighty. Jesus was saying, you do your part, I'll do my part. <laughs> Come on, you're just a pawn in this game. You do your part, I'll do my part. Turn me over to the Romans. And in three days, I'll raise myself up from the dead there's some who find the death on the cross as a display of weakness and folly even foolishness i said it earlier first corinthians 1 18 says for the preaching of the cross to those that perish foolishness but unto us which are saved it is the power of god that's why i told y'all last week two weeks ago natural minded people have no clue Unsaved people can only operate in the natural for the things of the spirit are spiritually discerned And when you're natural, you're not born again. You don't understand this The, the preaching of the cross is to those who are perishing who are lost who are natural minded Foolishness, but to those of us who are being saved or saved. It is the power of God That's why we're here tonight to hear preaching. We're not here tonight because of a man a man only We're not here tonight to hear rhetoric we're here tonight to hear from God. We're here tonight to hear preaching, the preaching of the cross. And that's what this is about tonight. But it should be that way every time we gather. Everything we do is from the cross. Everything we say is from the cross. Oh, I give unto you what I first received, how that Jesus came, lived, died, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scripture. I'm not going to wait and add that on to the end of the message. That's why I'm up here. Because if there be no resurrection, then I'll meet the night is in vain. But but there can be no resurrection without a death so this is Friday but Sunday is a coming and we need to understand that everything we do stems from 
the gospel. So they were expecting hyper arousal from Jesus. They, 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 they think it natural. What is hyper arousal? I'm glad you asked. It's a fight or flight response. Hyper arousal. When people are confronted with danger, and especially this type of hostility directed towards them, there's something in the adrenal. It's the, the adrenal gland releases something called adrenaline that will make an individual seek to preserve their lives or to run to protect their lives. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You have been in a situation, you go, oh, I got to get out of here. It's fight or flight. You either ladies pull for the mace or pull for your little daisy, little violet, whatever you call your pistol, and you get it close to you, or you seek an exit or way out. You might want to remember that when you pull into drive-ins, uh, getting food, that you don't pull directly up to the bumper in front of you. Where you going anyway? You're waiting in line. You keep space between you and that front car. If you have to make exit, stays right. You want to be able to turn out and you want to be able to get out of there. Now, there's something in you that releases that thing when that panic seems to come on you. Anybody ever been there at night at a gas station and you say, well, I'll just get gas tomorrow because I'm getting out of here. There's something that's the responsibility of the adrenal gland. So when Jesus didn't fight or flee and all he did was surrender, when he could have called 12 legion of angels, he just surrendered. Uh, there were those who saw this as weakness and a defeat or just maybe a malfunction of the adrenal gland. Here's the type of stuff they said, Mark 15, 31. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. They saw it as a weakness and inability of Jesus rather than the obedience of Jesus because he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You see how scriptures kind of tie in? You see how the writers over 1,500 years with 47 different writers seem to collaborate and share the same story and they never talk to each other? And so when you think about the death of the cross and his obedience, that's all he was being. He could have, but he showed the humility that he said he came to present, for he humbled himself, right? And humility is controlled strength. I could, but I won't. So people today in our society yet believe that dying, the people today, man, it's a weird world, that dying on that cross without a fight or flight, was a sign of weakness and is a sign of a weak leader. I had somebody tell me, how can you follow somebody who let people take him away when he's supposed to have been the son of God and he could have called 12 legions of angels. It's amazing how people know certain passages of scripture but don't understand the other passages. And it's, it's amazing to me how people read the scriptures naturally but don't get the meaning behind it. That's why Jesus said, I'm talking to you. Everybody else ain't going to understand this. So there's something in the message, behind the message. And uh, they said he's not able to save himself. But what they needed to know, that it was prophesied. This would be a sign of him actually being the Messiah. Amen. Glory to God. The, the Messiah, Isaiah 53, 7. It says it like this. He was oppressed and treated harshly. Yet he never said a word. Somebody said it, a mumbling word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep in silence before as a sheep is silent before the shearers he did not open his mouth this is what the eagle eye prophet isaiah saw concerning him this would be a part of his address and even his zip code when they came to get him he ain't gonna say nothing come on he's not gonna open his mouth that was a sign that this was the suffering servant the messiah how many of you can remember uh, shuddering at the scenes of that movie the passion of christ anybody but me i mean shuddering i mean you could actually feel the pain uh from the screen so we know that the actual account though was far worse than the movie presentation how bad was the movie 
How many of y'all go to R-rated movies? Anybody here you like R-rated movies? Anybody try to stay away from them? Anybody try to stay away from them? I see some hands, all right. This movie was rated R. And it wasn't rated R because of profanity and nudity. It was rated R because of the very content of the movie, the violence and the depiction that was on that screen of the suffering of the servant of God. Listen to the prophecies concerning the things surrounding uh, that suffering in those last 12 hours. Isaiah 52, 14. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know that he was a man. It's, it's very similar to a scene that I've seen in the natural where a person had been run over several times by an automobile and you could hardly tell that that person was a human being. Arms twisted and broken and body maimed and mauled. It's hard to even tell. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Yeah, that was good. Somebody felt that. You felt that all down in your bones, did you? You felt that all down in your toes. The rest of our time tonight will be more interrogative, right? Meaning it will be uh, questions and, and it will answer some questions. Uh, some of us still have questions. And what I'm trying to do for the rest of my life is give answers to people, to, to be uh, apologetic, not make apology, but to be one who contends for the faith and, and equips people to be able to answer and to know what you believe. God doesn't want us to follow him blindly. He doesn't want us just to believe, I believe, I believe, and just believe anything everybody says to you. Paul said that you need to be more uh, noble than the Thessalonians. You need to be like the Bereans and search the scriptures and see if what you're hearing is true. And so we got to search the scriptures, study to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman need not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. You ought to be glad that you're in a place where you are pricked in your consciousness, your cognitive processes are, are, are stimulated to make you go back and check out what's being said, where you at least have the word of God, where you at least look at the scriptures and you at least can search them because all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for you to have good teaching instruction in righteousness so that you can be complete and whole and furnished for good works so the rest of our time will be interrogative many of us need to know exactly why Jesus was crucified and of course how he was crucified why did Jesus have to die that is the $64,000 question if you play, what's the name of that game? $64,000 question. Period. Okay, let's see if we can answer why. Lord have mercy, that didn't go over well. <laughs> Jesus' death, first of all, was the will of the Father. But Jesus was also a voluntary participant. Again, this was not a plan gone bad. It was a part of God's predetermined plan. Remember, this is the same story. It will not change. Acts 2.23. And God knew what would happen. Glory to God. Help me, Holy Ghost. And his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. It was the what prearranged plan of God that was carried out. And Judas was the one who betrayed him, turned him over into the hands of these Romans, and they killed him. Why did Jesus have to die like he did? These are the questions. His suffering teaches us, watch this, how to handle our own sufferings. Jesus did everything he did for us. 
That's why when I read earlier, he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our people, the punishment by his stripes. We were healed and you heard that screech. You heard that cry because somebody who's been healed realized that they were healed because of what he did. Jesus dying on that cross sets us free. So his suffering also teaches us something. Teaches us how to handle our own sufferings. 1 Peter 2, 21. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is our, your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned, nor even deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threatened revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right by his wounds or stripes. You are healed. And the text says, King James, he's our perfect example of suffering that we should follow in his footsteps. He went through what he went through as an example for us. We can go through it. Even Israel, his body, his people, what they went through was an example to us. So God leaves us examples. And if you think it's rough, look under Jesus. You think you can't make it? Come on, look under Jesus. You think somebody did you wrong? Look under Jesus. Somebody betrayed you? Look at Jesus. Somebody rejected you? Look at Jesus. You were left alone by yourself? Look at Jesus. He's our perfect example. He didn't retaliate, didn't try to get revenge. He didn't stalk them. He didn't make up a fake page and, and send them. He didn't try to entrap them. Jesus' passion teaches us how to be obedient, even in our trials and even in our trouble. Philippians 2.8, he was obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. Hebrews 5, 8. Though he were a son, yet he learned, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. You can learn obedience through suffering. stick to Steadfastness. Holding on. We like quoting that verse. Be ye steadfast, unmovable. Always abounding in the word of the... That's a song that Florida Mass Choir sang in 1983. When I got saved, it was the first album I ever bought. And I found out that that was 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. And I said, people sing scriptures. I was 26, almost 27 years old before I realized that there were spiritual songs and songs sung in the Bible. I didn't have any gospel songs. I didn't know. Only gospel song I knew was one toad over the line, sweet Jesus, one toad over the line. Sitting downtown in a railway station, one toad over the line. I thought that was gospel. And of course, I did know one other, the Commodores. Father. Help your children, don't let them fall by the side of the road. Man, I, you know, but you be slow dragging to that. <laughs> so it, it's one of those things. I had no concept of, of, of scripture, of, of God, or anything. But the biggest question is not those things. The biggest question is why. Why? Did Jesus die on the cross? Now, if you need a theological answer, here's one. He died to atone for our sins. All right? That's the theological answer. Now, you have to understand theology, right? Theology is the study of God, and they got a lot of terms, a lot of theological terms that mess people up. Atonement is one of them. But it simply means atonement at one time meant at one meant it is being brought back connected to God it's the state of being one again or reconciled it's the thought is being brought back together 
Come on. Jesus came and bridged the gap between God and man. That's why he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Come on. Jesus repaired the breach. He is the mediator between God and man. For there's only one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And so he has atoned us, right? It's in Romans, Romans 5, 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now, that atonement also has built in it another theological term called propitiation. Say that, propitiation. 1 John 2, 2, it's in the Bible. He, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for what? The whole world. You can talk with the master on for what? The whole world. When Jesus died on that cross, he not only canceled sin, right? He not only is our expiation, just took away our sin, the sin that we have committed in life, but Jesus also vicariously paid the penalty demanded by God because of our sin. See, he who knew no sin, and let me just show it to you, propitiation, let me define it. Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for sin, which a holy God demanded of man, the sinner. So not only did he take away our sin, but he appeased God's justice and God's wrath. He died in our place and took our punishment, which, he, which, 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 which was death for sinning. So Christ died in our stead the wages of sin is death and we all deserve to die but while we were yet sinning Christ died in our stead I wish I had somebody so he died and he bore our sins so the songwriter meant well but it's not necessarily true he looked beyond our faults and he saw our need no he didn't look beyond your fault he saw your faults and he dealt with them he supplied what you needed himself on that cross. So then 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says this, God wanted us to be right and in right standards before him. So here's what happened. God, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. You know that verse that he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made and found the righteousness of God in Christ. And so he who knew no sin became sin. That's what another theological term means, impeccable. Say that, impeccable. Impeccable for some of you is when you look in the mirror and you have done your hair and you got your makeup on and you won't fleet. That's old now, understand? But you look at yourself in the mirror and you go, I'm impeccable. You don't fix nothing, right? But impeccable in this phrase, in, this, in, this, in, 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 in the context of the scripture is he was incapable of sinning. He didn't have an earthly human nature. God was his father. Mary just carried him. Come on, y'all. Let me keep going here because it's seventh inning stretch on a Friday night, but I got to get this right. So to continue the interrogatory cycle, I guess now we could also answer the question, what? What? Meaning, what did his death do on the cross? What did his death do? His death on the cross enables us to be able to live the kind of life that glorifies God. This is where the church has taken a big hit. We don't exude the type of life that glorifies God. We are not salt and light. We don't step into the room and atmosphere shift now, chains be broken, pray God. We don't bring that to the table. We're priests. All of us are kings and priests, and we should spend time before the holy God. And like the priests of old, they handled the oils, and the oils had an aroma. And when you've been with God, and you come out of the presence of God, people ought to be able to smell that you have been with God. They ought to smell the aroma of your incense, your prayers that have gone up to God. Come on, sweet-smelling Savior ought to be 
overflowing from you. People ought to be able to tell when you walk into the room that you are a little different, that there's something about you. And in the world today, people are basing Christianity on the lack of light and salt of the people who claim to be Christian. Oh, I thought y'all would shout on that and run outside because that's what our problem is. We don't live the kind of lives that the cross has granted us. We don't live this abundant life that Jesus came to give us. We're whining and complaining and murmuring and, and, and going through and always tripping over nothing. Up today, down tomorrow, in our feelings. Jesus came to free you from that. He said, I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly, uh, exceeding abundantly. Uh, you got to have that kind of life. That's what he's come to bring us. I wish I had somebody who said to me, Bishop, I want that kind of life. That's the kind of life I want to live. That's the kind of life I want to lead. And thank you for inviting us out on this good Friday night to remind us that his death, that what he died for is for us to have. I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I but Christ that's what the next verse says Galatians 2:20. Uh, I was crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me you should have run you should have shouted you should have said amen you should have thrown up a hand so the fact of the matter is that you can only live for him if you have died in him. So all those feelings I was talking about earlier, people always hurt. People talking about church hurt. <laughs> Listen, you can't hurt a dead man. Leave here tonight and go to the morgue. Cut, cut, cut to your heart desire. Ain't nobody going to holler because they're dead. And we are dead and our lives are hid with God in Christ. His death provided the power that we need to live a righteous life over sin. And to have power over the devil. Dunamis, I love that boy. and not seen him forever. He says, I got the power. You got the power. We got the power. Now what we going to do with it? So what did him dying on the cross do for us? I'm glad you asked. Colossians 2.13. You were dead because of your sins. And because your sinful nature was not yet cut away, then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Come on, he made a show of them openly. He shamed them, handed you the victory, forgave you of your sins, died in your place, took the, the, the punishment for sin, died on your behalf. He is the penal substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. God has been assuaged or, or satisfied. His justice has been satisfied because of what Christ did. The cross broke the devil's back. The cross set those of us who were captives and bound free. That's all of us, y'all. Don't sit there looking at me with those sheep as eyes. You were bound. You were tore up from the flow up. You were no good. I don't care how sweet you were. I used my wife all the time. My wife was a goody two shoes. The worst thing I've ever seen her do was read a Harlequin novel. She would sit in the bed and read her little love stories. Glory be to God. And felt filthy from reading them. But one day she heard an old, old story about a savior king from glory. And she had heard this all her life having grown up in church she was a goody two shoes but she knew she wasn't a Christian and many people need to admit that just because you've been in the church all your life don't make you a Christian like you sleeping in your garage doesn't make you a car so one day when my wife was about 27 years old she called upon the name of the Lord and I'm still telling y'all whoever you are today wherever you are out there whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved so that was what he came to do and finally, the question is, how? How did he do it? And that's what that passion movie, and that's what that Friday night of the Passion Week was all about. 
what Christ was asked to do, no other human being could have ever done because he was the God man. It's the hypostatic union. For some of y'all who like to get up and say the God part or the human part, there's no God part and human part. That would make him a demigod. He was all God and all man. And even the early church fathers wrestled over that. It's called the hypostatic union. How that God became man. That Jesus had the seed of the woman. Remember, he said the seed of the woman. That he would be born of a woman, but God would be his father. That God said unto my God, lo, I go into the volume of the book to do your will. That his name would be called Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. That that would be a great mystery. First Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. Great is the mystery of God. It is that God was manifest in the flesh. First John 5, 7 said for uh, the, 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 the three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And then John 1 says that the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. And there was nothing made up, but that made by him and for him and through him do all things consist. And that word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as that of only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I'm preaching better than y'all looking at me. I don't have a problem with Jesus being God. Because the Bible said if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. But didn't he say destroy this temple and in three days I will raise him? Come on, God raised Jesus. Jesus raised himself. There are no words that exist that can really portray the extent of his suffering. Beginning with the mock trial. They knew he was innocent. And they tried to find fault with him. And Pilate washed his hands. I find no fault in the man. He was sent from judgment hall to judgment hall. And finally there was a rule that says this time of the year that the Romans, they could release one of their own to them, whoever they wanted it to be, guilty or not guilty. And they gave him a choice, Jesus or Barabbas. They said, away with Jesus and give us Barabbas. They put a mock robe on him then. You're the king of the Jews. So they put this mock robe on him and they put a mock crown. The crown was a crown of thorns. Thorns with the hypodermics of the needle so long that when shoved on the head or with hit on the head by, by one of the soldiers, the needles would stick down into the neck, into the, the brain. You've heard me mention the central nervous system and the medulla oblongata that uh, these things that send pain signals would be activated through this, 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 this torturous crown of thorns that's placed on his head that would also seep blood down into his eyes and into his mouth and into his ears and every orifice from his chest up from his shoulders up would be drenched and soaked in blood he already the, the crimson uh, mask began to to be on his face they they put a bag over his head and slapped him and said prophesy tell us who hit you if you're a prophet they they mocked him it was sad they spit in his face they treated him like a common criminal and he did not say one word he was tortured beyond anything i can explain tonight i've tried many times to try to explain this and every year is the same story every time you speak of this it's the same story it doesn't change somebody said well is he going to preach about that is he going to talk about what happened is he going to talk about what they did to him you have to because it was that friday night the week of suffering that jesus endured this he would torture behind anything I could even say he was whipped with a cat of nine tails if you don't know what that is that's a leather strap with bone and marrow that's metal that's that's in it that's that's in in the straps and it, it's embedded in it and 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 when when it hits you the, 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 they would rake that strap across the back so that the lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and, and leave quivering, quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh dangling from the body, just raking across his body. Uh, it, it, imagine a whip that, that, that could strike the flesh that had balls of metal heavy balls of metal in it woven into it in, in order to cause boom, first of all a deep bruise and a swelling to where they would burst and the contusions would, would open up and then the skin would now be ready for the sharp piercing of the raking of the bone and the metal and it would cut the flesh as easy as razor over soft butter it was just made that way boom 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 and it would rip and imagine a human being 
he was very God, yes, but he was also a man. So imagine he felt all of this and imagine why he went through this. Imagine uh, uh, what he went through this for and imagine now how he went through this. He didn't do it because he sinned. He did it because we sinned. All of our griefs, all of our sorrow, all of our sin, everything was placed upon him from the shoulders down to the back of his legs every nerve ending would be screaming sending pain signals back to the brain causing screeching and screams that could never match the pain itself i don't care how loud he got it is. it didn't matter how loud he got it did not match the pain that he felt i've tried to explain some instances sometimes where i've had real bad pain and oh it hurts and i, I you can't explain it because nobody can understand what you're really going through but you nobody knows how bad your pain is but you and when you're really going through something like that and you're screaming it never matches what's really going on you can't out shout your pain and so when people are crying out and we don't treat them fairly and, and we don't help them and support them and, and, and we, we, we take for granted that they're just hurting a little bit that their, their cries are never louder than their pain I'm trying to help somebody it's never louder what people are going through people wind up committing suicide because somebody didn't understand that the cry was not louder than the pain the pain that people go through they can't articulate it when you think about the crucifixion, there's no man that can articulate. Uh, they tried to put it on the big screen, but a uh, lady even had a heart attack and died watching it. But it still wasn't the pain. It wasn't to the level of the pain that Jesus experienced. It is said sometimes that the veins would be laid bare and the very muscles, the sinews and the bowels of the victim would be open and exposed. That his very bowels would seep out. And he would be hanging there. And by the way, he was naked on that cross. Many people, though, would have died from the beating alone. And that's what they tried to do to knock off early. Let's kill him. Let's beat him. Let's make him so anemic. Let's get so much blood out of him that they would just die. But not Jesus. They couldn't have killed him on the whipping post. They couldn't have killed him with the cat of nine tails. You know why? He had to get to that cross. <laughs> Why? He had to die on that beam. Why? That's the only way that you and I were going to be redeemed. And the curse was going to be ripped. Up. The curse of poverty. The curse of sickness. The curse of all of these diseases. For cursed is he that hangeth on a tree. Many people would have died. It would be on that torn open back that he would carry his own cross. Now what my daughter sang tonight, the Via Dolorosa. And he would walk that winding road, that road of suffering is what it means, to the tune of the jeers and the abuse of the crowd. Even the crowd, those that he came to say, spit on him. He tried to make his way through the narrow streets and they would push him and push him and push him to the point to where he fell beneath the weight of the cross also being pushed and being shoved by the people in the crowd someone in the crowd is summoned to help him carry his cross anemic and weakening Simon comes and helps him carry the cross must Jesus bear his cross alone and all the world go free. Jesus didn't even bear his own cross. And that's what he says about the Holy Spirit. As I was with you, as in you, with you, I shall be in you. And I'm going to send you another comforter, another me, somebody that will stand alongside of you. The paracletos, uh, a, a lawyer, somebody to intercede for you, to help you when you're weak, to help you when you're going through, to help you when you can't make it, to help you when you fall, to help you when people are mistreating you, to help you when people are pushing you down, to help you when people are crabbing and grabbing your legs to help you he finally makes it through the crowd and he gets to the hill called Galgotha Skull Mountain and there's a vertical beam already lying on the ground awaiting his revival he has his beam but this beam has to connect with the other the other beam is the petty bellum 
and they lay his body on the beam and they nailed tapered nails through his wrists, attaching them to that horizontal beam. Had he been nailed in the hands, he would have slipped right off of that cross. So the nails actually went through his wrists. Experts who knew that they could not break a bone. Experts who could stint a nail because the text says not one bone of his body would be broken. So they had to slide those nails into his into his wrist and that's what you saw in that movie those are the things that made me cringe my savior my lord my god why are they why would someone do that what makes a man reject the savior what makes a man crucify you afresh what makes a man even today what makes somebody reject the fact that jesus came to die it's the only hope I have. It's the only reason I live. If this wasn't true, I wouldn't be up here. I don't have to be up here. I could do something else. I was doing something else. I had a good job. I had money. I had houses. I had a semblance of fame. But when I gave my heart to Jesus, I had to accept everything that he was. I had to accept all that he does. I had to accept his story. I had to believe it. It's what got me. It's what got me. They, they, they crucified my Savior. Were you there when they crucified the Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Sometimes uh, it causes me to tremble. 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 So they had him. They nailed his hands and they, they nailed his feet. His feet are nailed, and the median nerve, for those of you that go home and study this, is crushed, and the pain is unbearable. Ew! But the cry does not match the pain. The way he was hung, they hung him, what we know as an affliction, and they dropped him. In a hole. And the way they dropped him, it would have caused his shoulders to be dislocated. And when they were doing the movie and they got to that particular scene, the guy who played uh, Jesus on that cross said his shoulders were dislocated when they dropped him in that hole. Actually, it would have ripped both of his shoulders out of place and he had been hanging by his sinew and tissue and muscle. In order to breathe, he'd have to push up on the nails in his feet. He'd have to push up off of the nails, the medium nerve. He'd have to push up just to catch his breath while his mouth and his nose is filled with with his own blood. His lungs are filling with fluid. And here he is on this cross in a flex trying to get air, pushing up on the nails in his feet. I can barely breathe. The nail tears further through the foot, eventually locking up against the tarsal bones in the legs, and he would be dying a slow death of asphyxiation. I I can't breathe. I can't breathe. The carbon dioxide in his blood dissolves as carbonic acid, causing the acidity of the blood to increase, leading to what we know as an an irregular heartbeat. And as he's hanging there in agony, he utters his famous seven last words. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, our perfect example of suffering is also our perfect example of forgiveness. He could have gone 12 legions. He could have come down. These are the very people that are taking the responsibility for killing him, even though he's laying down his life. And he says, Father, 
Stephen was being stoned, he understood the words of Jesus and had remembered them. And when he was being stoned, he looked up to heaven and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. And he said, Father, lay not this sin to their charge. They're ignorantly killing me. And so we sing that song, if people knew who we were, they wouldn't mess with us. If they only knew who we were, they would leave us alone. The devil should have known this, but he didn't know it. Number two, he said to the thief on the cross with him that believed on him, today you will be with me in paradise. Somebody tonight, you need to understand, you might be this close to death and dying. Some of you may have to go and see a loved one or call someone up. They might have lived like hell all their life. But as long as they got breath in their lungs, and I'm trying to help somebody tonight to know this, as long as you got breath in your lungs, you can call upon the name of the Lord. You don't have to be worried about what they didn't live for God. They didn't do nothing. No, his grace is sufficient for everybody. His blood was shed for everybody. You don't earn it. You don't do anything to get it. You don't have to work for it. You just have to receive it. And he believed. Y'all not getting this. He said, woman. Behold your son. Everybody was gone but Mary and John. And other Mary was there at the cross. His mother had to behold him. That's the one she gave up to. That's the one she, she, she nursed. That's the one she raised her son. Her son is on that cross and they're making a show of him. Openly, he's naked. He's hanging there. He cannot help himself. And she's watching this and they're treating him and mistreating him so bad he doesn't even resemble her man, no less her son. And then he cries, Eli! Eli! Lama sabachthani! That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what he feared in the garden. He wasn't fearing the suffering. He wasn't fearing the pain. He wasn't fearing what he had to go through. He knew that the day would come, that he would become sin. And Habakkuk said the father's eyes are too pure as to behold sin or to look on evil. And he knew that for a fleeing moment, once he became sin, that he would be separated from his father. He would not be able to find him and touch him like he always has. For one moment, he would not have communication with the father. Eli, Eli, I must box the name, my God. My God, why have you forsaken me? And again, he was hung up for our hangups. And again, he was on that cross, but it was us. We nailed him to that tree. Our sins nailed him to that tree. He was on that tree. The father turned his back on him, didn't communicate with him at that moment because of our sins, because of what we did, pedophilia, adultery, fornication, lying, cheating, stealing, cussing, the things that we do in our lives, those things that Jesus came to die for. He said, I thirst. He was a man. He thirst. And then he said, it is finished. You see, it wasn't over. It was finished. Come on, I'm preaching better than y'all looking at me. It wasn't over. It was finished. He wasn't done. He was finished. And then he said, Father... Into your hands, I commit my spirit. Remember, I said something to you about an irregular heartbeat. The irregular heartbeat became the signal to him that he was about to die, which would enable him to say, Father, into the hand I commit my spirit and those in the medical profession today said he died of cardiac arrest simply stated he died of a broken heart 
So lastly, let's answer the questions that folks still have today. Why did he die? He died to save us from our sins. That's why he died. What did it do for us? It gave us power. To live for him. Remember interrogatory. And how did he die? He died on an old rugged cross. It was at the cross. At the cross. Where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away it was there by faith that I received my son and now I may not look like it but I'm happy all the day my wife is one of the strongest women I've ever met in my life Sometimes I feel so unworthy being in the same house with her. Because I've watched her life and I've seen her demonstrate resiliency and faith in God and unfeigned faith and unadulterated belief that what God said, God is able to do. Her brother died today. And my wife texts me to explain to me that her brother had died. They had found his body in his driveway. And she said, I'm good. And it's still a good Friday. Imagine what it takes. Come on, some of y'all would be a basket case right now. But her faith is not in man. Her faith is in God and because her faith is in God she's safe she's secure she's an overcomer she's they took Jesus down and they buried him they buried him in a borrowed tomb they put guards around it to protect it but he was dead but I said all of that to say this that was Friday but Sunday is a coming. Come on, y'all. This is Friday. Come on, y'all. But Sunday is a coming. Come on, if you believe that Sunday is a coming, that on the third day, come on, y'all, he rose again. So, Father, I do thank you tonight. For your loving kindness and your tender mercy. I thank you for this story. I thank you that it doesn't change. Why he died. What it did for us. How he did it. is not the same none of us are perfect of God it was your son who was perfect we may not ever be able to understand the screeches the screams what it costs our sins nailed on that cross why he did it what it did for us we try to understand it, how he did it he could have come down but he stayed up there and it was your only son father you gave your only begotten son I wouldn't have given my son I'll never know how much
wretched cause to see my sin upon that cross. Never, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never. Never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it costs to see. But here I am. Here I am to worship. Here I am. Here I am to bow. Here I am. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together love me. All together worthy. All together Fall to me. Listen, He is who He is. We are who we are. He is with us even until the end of time. If we're going to get through the struggles that we're facing now in this life, if we're going to overcome the decadence and the descent that people have concerning us, if we're going to get through and come out of here whole if we're going to win people to Christ and build the kingdom if we're going to be able to endure tragedies in our life and things with joy if we're going to overcome the world and live as overcomers we're going to have to believe that Jesus came lived and died on that cross we got to learn this story we got to know this story we don't need to just hear it once a year we need to hear it many times during the year you need to tell this story to your children and your children's children they need to know what jesus went through for you and yes we'll never know what it really costs we'll never know but one day beloved we'll see him face to face and then we shall know even as we are known one day we're gonna find out how many y'all ready one day we're gonna find out the eastern sky is going to split and we're going to see him. He's coming. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And if we wish our life will remain, shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So those of you that are watching tonight, God bless you. May God keep you. May you rehearse this and play this again. Go right back and look at it again. Share it with your friends and let them know this is a good Friday. Let them know that Jesus died. There's a resurrection coming, but he had to die first. On that Friday night of Passion Week, he hung his head and he died. He gave up the ghost. But on the third day, we're going to see what's going to happen. You never, I'll never know. Come on. There's enough on the screen you can call it. We'll take care of you. God bless you. Until next time, may heaven smile on you. Y'all let me know when it's good back there. I love you. God bless you. See you next time. See you this coming Sunday morning, 8 o'clock, and Sunday morning at 11 o'clock right here at the Potter's House. God bless you, and God keep you. Come on, put your hand together and bless the Lord. Amen. We pray you were blessed by the worship experience here at the Potter's House. Make sure you share this word with a loved one on your timeline and newsfeed. And remember, there are five ways that you can give. First, you can give by text by simply texting the word GIVE to 904-601-1695. Follow the prompts and you will receive a confirmation text of your gift. 
You may also give online at tphim.org backslash give. You can give through our Ministry One or Ezekiel Church app by downloading the app and following the instructions to give. Or you can mail in your gifts addressed to TPHIM at 5119 Normandy Boulevard, Jacksonville, Florida, 32205. Once again, we thank you for your continued generosity to the Potter's House. And for those of you who have answered the call to salvation, please call or text us at 855-TPH-4JAX. That's 855-874-4529. And until the next time, remember to share this message and stay connected via Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel at TPH-JAX. May God bless you and keep you until our next digital gathering.